Thank you for inviting me to this terrific series. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through to you, through with you uh, my, my new trade book project, um, which is uh, about, which is an extension of my, my sort of lately life work on fascism, <clears throat> uh, but sort of the education components, focusing specifically on what elements make an education into a fascist education. And my purpose in this book is to try to sort of distinguish a fascist education from other kinds of nationalist educations, bring out the gender component, you know, solve, solve the, the a fascist education on my thinking is an education that makes fascist politics effective. So my goal is to sort of figure out the structure of that. And of course, I'm going to be draw as in my last book, How Fascism Works, I'm drawing on lots of international, lots of examples uh, across the globe, including uh, the current attack on democracy right now. What I'm trying to figure out, what, what should be clear is that every time you have a, an attack on democracy, it comes with an attack on the education system as well. So what we're seeing, you know, I, I had recently a, uh, I mean, yesterday, a UK academic say to me with an ast astonishment, surely Florida isn't willing to, Texas isn't willing to simply give up their major research institutions. Sure they are. They're throwing them, you know, they're, they're perfectly willing to say we're going to have no major research institutions anymore in these states because we're going to be an authoritarian society. And so that's just the, the game plan. And, and, and my question is, um, why? <laughs> why is that so important? How does it work? What is the kind of education that replaces it? So, um, so you know, the, the reason this interests me, I mean, the sort of my life background story is, is that, uh, you know, I come from my, my, my mother was Polish Jewish raised in Siberia in the Gulag, as I'll, I'll talk about in, a, in, a, in later later in this talk. Um, and my father was was raised in Berlin under the Nazis in the 1930s. Uh, and he came from a very distinguished Jewish family. My, my grandmother was an actor. She ran her own theater. She was in the Max Reinhardt Theater. Uh, she was in the movie Metropolis. Uh, the uh, Fritz Lang was a family friend. Her her father was the cantor, the Oberkanta of the largest Jewish congregation in Germany. Um, and before that, he was an opera singer. I have on my in my home, I have a poster of the Wagner Ensemble under Angelo Neumann and their production of the Ring in 1901 in the Prague Opera. And uh, my great uncle is dressed as Sie was playing Siegfried and is dressed as Siegfried. He was one of the Max Dowson. He was one of the original Bayreuth singers. By the way, this is an anti-Semitic uh, 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 technology. It it does raise hands every time. It says I'm raising my hand every time I'm simply speaking. So uh, so um, so so the two Jewish members of the Wagner Ensemble were my great uncle and great grandfather. So this was an uh, this was a a Cosima Wagner called my great uncle Der Urjude. So this was an assimilated Jew German Jewish family. And yet, <laughs> you know, yet they were eventually ostracized and removed from society. And as as you know, I'm German and you know, I love my one of my two home countries and uh but how did Germany uh, what happened so that people like my family were ejected from Berlin, which was the most sophisticated city, arguably, of the world at its time. Humboldt University counted among its graduates. Here I have a list. Uh, 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 you, you know, uh, Albert Einstein, Erwin Schrödinger, Max Planck, Max Weber, and Du Bois went to Humboldt University Berlin. <laughs> you know, so, so how did it happen? that such a cultured, civilized, intellectual society um, descended into this kind of, uh, frankly, barbarism. This is also the question Du Bois, of course, asks in the world in Africa. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid the Du Bois scholars in the audience. So, um, the, uh, so, so and, and I've come to think that the education system is central here. 
Um, so, uh, so, so, so Nazism, Nazism's most potent symbols took the form of actions, um, actions, actions directed against the cosmopolitanism that my my family exemplified, um, not the Polish side, the German side. <laughs> so the the so the the, the Nazi the Nazis. Um, so my father was one year old. Uh, uh, when on May 10th, 1933, the Nazis carried out a ma massive book burning on open, open plots, not far from his from his apartment. Um, it's taught everywhere, even in post-war Germany, as one of the country's most important historical events. Um, chief among the items the Nazis burned in the open plots book burning uh, was a library as well as the vast ar archive of Magnus Hir Hirschfeld's a collection in the Institute for Sexuelle Wissenschaft, which was the largest collection of LGBT uh, uh, volumes and perspectives uh, in the world, and the largest collection of uh, of representations of uh, gender fluidity. Uh, so this was one of the very. This is their first target, essentially. Um, so what were they? They were what were they trying to do? They were trying to eliminate the entire perspective. From which queer life was was legible. They were trying to make uh, LGBT perspectives completely illegible. Uh, they sought to eliminate the conceptual basis for the normalization of queer life. Uh, the the Weimar Republic involved liberal and progressive reforms and experimentation in education. These reforms in education, it wasn't just LGBT life and LGBT perspectives that the Nazis took aim at. It was per, per, um, progressive ideas in education. When you look at the actual Nazi political campaigns, not, they characteristically attacked public schools and education as, as progressive, as involving Marxist thinking, uh, as, as, uh, as, you know, not centering the greatness of the nation. But they took aim at progressive reforms in education. They took aim at progressive histories. Um, the Nazis realized that, uh, that vilifying progressive ideas in education was a powerful way to make traditionally conservative voters think that the Nazis were protecting their children. Uh, in the literature, uh, for instance, in Lisa Pine's Education in Nazi Germany, she says, characteristically, these progressive ideas in education were represented as Marxist ways of thinking. So that was the very, that was Nazi propaganda to represent even liberal progressive ideals, uh, ideas as Marxist. Um, now, before I, before I, uh, now, the Nazi education was not, technocratic in 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 a way that we need to worry about in say the United States today where they're trying to rem remove all human humanities education in certain places and 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 replace it with job skills um uh and and there's no question that classical education uh is is in some sense a bulwark against certain kinds of authoritarianism so in chapter 3 of Du Bois's souls of black folk of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others, um, Du Bois responds to the view, which he attributes to Booker T. Washington, that black Americans should just focus on wealth creation and not on acquiring humanistic knowledge, Du Bois writes. And so thoroughly did Washington learn the speech and thought of triumphant commercialism and the ideals of material prosperity, that the picture of a lone black boy pouring over a French grammar amid the weeds and dirt of a neglected home seemed to him the acme of absurdities. One wonders what Socrates and St. Francis of Assisi would say to this. According to Socrates, acquiring knowledge is the goal of human existence. To scoff at Black Americans who seek this goal to restrict what's available to them to industrial education, never mind that Booker T. Washington really meant by industrial education, picking cotton, uh, but uh, but to restrict them to industrial education is dehumanizing. Uh, so, so we need to worry today about solely uh, technocratic educations 
that omit classical humanist educations, uh, like industrial education and isolation, simply turning, treating, teaching your kids to code is dehumanizing, uh, preventing them from reading uh, Plato. Um, but we have to be careful because Nazi education, it's one of the first things you notice when you delve into the literature on Nazi education, is it elevates great books, is it focuses on and elevates great books. So classics received a huge amount of support during the 1930s from the Nazi government. Suddenly, Scandinavian history would receive the same money as physics. So, so what Nazi education does is it presents classical education not for its universalist appeals and ideals, the ones that led Du Bois and Souls to talk about uh, lifting people above the veil of racism. Rather, Nazi education focuses on glorifying the identities of the people who created those cultural products. So. Uh, so German nationalism, so fascism is always based on a kind of ultranationalism. Germ Nazism, German fascism is based on German nationalism. And dating back to Fichte's addresses uh, to the German nation, German nationalism, the German nationalists viewed themselves as the successors to ancient Greece. So the, the idea in Nazi education was to present these cultural products as the work of of Aryans, of white of, of white people. And the idea was this is civilization. So instead of presenting them as universal ideas, instead of saying, here are some universal ideas, here are some other universal ideas that you can get from say Indian philosophy or uh uh or or Jews, <laughs> uh, uh you it was presented as a kind of glorification of an identity, the reverse, if you will, of universalism. So we have to be careful when we're presented with great books programs, we have to be careful to inspect what's being done. What's being done very often is we're, our eyes are being directed to the authors of these works, the white men who authored these works. And the goal of teaching these syllabi can, can be not the laudable and indeed necessary one of teaching Plato and Aristotle to convey the wealth of universal ideas that comes from that tradition and others, but, but to direct us to the greatness of this supposed single thread of civilization from the Greeks to, to Thomas Jefferson. So when you have, when 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 people are talking about say so in in reading in reading the literature on nazi education i'm struck how often you know it's about you're really supposed to look through the ideas towards the creators of the ideas and their identity like i think when people talk about the founders we're supposed to look through the ideas and think about the white christian men that they were and we're supposed to think okay that's why these ideas are great they were created by white christian men so uh, so the question I've always had, probably the question of my life, is how could the education system have produced out of Germans uh, committed Nazis? So, so this is an application, as I've said, of my larger project on fascism, on how fascism wins de democratic elections, how fascism as a politics, as a culture, can dominate. Um, so I conceive, so I, I, so my book, How Fascism Works, is about how, about fascist politics, how fascist politics can win elections, how certain tactics can be used to win an election. Talk, great replacement theory, raising fear and anger about being decentered. This book is about a specific is, is I have a chapter on education in that book called anti-intellectualism, but this book is an outgrowth, is a, is, a, uh, is, is a book about just the education component. How do you do an education system that makes people receptive to fascist politics? So, uh, so I'm, going to, I'm going to start with, uh, with 
some mechanisms, and this is going to be incomplete because this is a book and I'm presenting you essentially with my book proposal um, or part of it. <laughs> um, so so I, I, I want to begin by going more general than fascism and talking about, and I want to talk about uh, the, the, um, the role, uh, the role of, of, uh, of suppression of ideas, which is key to fascist education. Now, it is a complete mistake to say that, that censorship in education is invariably, say, authoritarian. I mean, uh, you know, Rousseau, uh, in Rousseau's Emile, which is it's supposed to be a democratic education. I mean, it's kind of a weird education, but but uh, but it's supposed to be a democratic education. There's obviously censorship. The poor kids only allowed to read Robinson Crusoe, basically. And so uh, so um, Plato, okay, Plato's an authoritarian, but Plato is all about censorship and the Republic. Um, but I want to talk about in a general way about the suppression of ideas and and what it does. And I'm going to begin also in a personal vein. Uh, with my father's dissertation, <laughs> uh, as one does. Uh, so, so my father, who was a sociologist, who was then an anthropologist, wrote his dissertation, Heritage of Change, British Education and the Making of an African Intelligentsia, while living in Kenya just before independence in the years 1950, while living in Uganda and Kenya in the years 1959 to 1962. It is a study chiefly of the first generation of Western educated members of Kenya's largest tribe, the Kikuyu. Uh, and its focus is restricted to students whose entire education took place in British schools in Kenya and Uganda. He argues in the dissertation that these schools were designed to create an East African intelligentsia that identified with the British, uh, shared their values, their perspectives, and most importantly, their religion. The tacit goal was to continue a kind of permanent British rule, at least ideologically, but via Kenyan proxy. So it's a study of what's sometimes called in the anti-colonialist literature, the post-colonial elite and the construction of the post-colonial elite. Alliance High School is Kenya's premier boarding school and has graduated generation after generation of future Kenyan pol politicians and leaders. Founded by Christian missionaries from the Church of Scotland Mission, it prides itself to this day in its focus in Christianity. And generally, the Kenyan schools, there's a national curriculum, and Christian religious education is central to that national curriculum. And if you want to learn to read in Kenya, or you want to learn to graduate from school, you are going to be going to a school uh, that has, uh, like, most of the majority of the schools, you're going to need to know the Bible. I mean, I've, I'm looking at the tests right now. Uh, as part of this project and is extensive, detailed knowledge of the Christian Bible. And we're talking about a country where people's great grandparents were born with other religions, Kikuyu, Luo, with other traditional religions. But the level of Christianity and the public education, uh, its embeddedness is incredibly intense. Um, now, uh, when my father was there, Kenya had just experienced a revolt against British rule, colonial rule, the Mau Mau Rebellion, that was violently suppressed under the so-called emergency, under the emergency. Uh, the Mau Mau Rebellion was led by Kikuyu, and my father's field notes reveal a good deal of awareness of the immense horrors. Um, he, he has one passage in his field notes where he's staying at the house of a, uh, of a, of a Kenyan who was placed in and who was a police commander and had shot suspected Mau Mau guerrillas on site. And my father said, but his brother was the only Kenyan actually imprisoned by even the British because he was burying suspected Mau Mau guerrillas alive. So the practices in the 1950s directed against the Mau Mau were, I mean, you probably know histories of the hanged. This has been covered lately. The Kikuyu are I think the only group that has received now some reparations uh, from British colonialism. So, but my father was looking at the education system. My father was looking at the ideological domination. Um, so his dissertation is a case study in how education can indoctrinate a, po a, a, a population. Uh, in this case, to to uh, to accept the logic of co colonialism and the preeminent value of Western education at all levels. 
His dissertation reveals an, an effort at cultural genocide by education. Uh, clearly articulated assumptions embodied in curricula and enacted in the day-to-day -day life of educational institutions at every value affirmed the content and value of Western education versus the varied communal and tribal forms of socialization, which were the traditional form of education of the peoples of East Africa. My father repeatedly notes in his field notes how his student, how the students he was studying pointed this out to him. In the, uh, so, and, and in the case of the Kikuyu, this followed immediately after a physical genocide uh, during the 1950s. Um, horrifying, so, uh, so, and his field notes, you find him going back to Berlin all the time. And so in thinking about how he, a Holocaust survivor, ends up writing a dissertation on British colonialism, um, well, I, once my first like week at Yale, I it was Yale, and so I immediately sent an email to Sheila Benavid and said, "I want to have lunch with you. You're Sheila Benavid." So, uh, so, so we went out, and I asked her this question: Why did my father write his dissertation on this? She said, "Jason, part two of Origins of Totalitarianism is called Imperialism," <laughs> and and uh, and and indeed, my father, one of his favorite stories was when he was in the Kenyan bush, he was attacked by a flying cockroach, which he slew with his copy of Origins of Totalitarianism. So therefore he was going out to visit families in the uh, Kikuyu reservations at the time where they were they were placed in the white British people took the white highlands, all the good land and the Kikuyu were placed in reservations. And he was there and he took Origins, which is kind of a big book to take while traveling. Therefore suggesting that he clearly was thinking about these parallels. So, uh, so the British colonial education system in Kenya gave and gives today native Kenyans and other East African students a British education. Um, my father remarks on how remarkable the knowledge that, uh, that this first generation of Kikuyu had of every British monarch dating back hundreds and hundreds of years. There's an enormous amount of time spent to this day on the Christian Bible. Um, of course, none of these Kikuyu students at that time were allowed any knowledge of their own religion because anyone caught practicing the Kikuyu religion was immediately sent to a concentration camp on, on, on suspicion of being a Mau Mau guerrilla. So, so there was a kind of complete obliteration. I mean, it was, it was dangerous to practice your religion. And, and this had obvious resonances for my father for his own, from his own childhood in Berlin. Uh, so uh, so the, the, the British educational system, so there was no class in the history of Kenya. There was no class in the history of, of Africa. So imagine coming, going through a school and graduating from a school without a single class suggesting that the place you live in even has a history. My father remarks on this again and again. <laughs> that uh, so uh, so the so the British educational system was designed to create in their minds a perspective from which the British Empire was central and ultimately justifiable. Its students were urged to identify with that perspective and ultimately invited to participate in exploited in its exploitative practices. The formation of the post-colonial elite, of course, being a dominant theme in, in the works of writers like Gugi Wathiongo. Um, <clears throat> but my father was too subtle a thinker uh, and decent a man not to see the complex ways East African students resisted or accommodated to the devil's deals opportunities they were that they were presented throughout the British system. Uh, so, <clears throat> My father believed in the power of Western higher education and even in the classical tradition of critical inquiry. But he saw how racism distorted that, how racism was used to sell that, to present it as greatness instead of universal ideas. Um, uh, so, so the British education system, what, what I've, I'm finding, I'm trying to bring out with the help of Gugi Wathiongo and Mukoma Wathiongo, his son, uh, University of Michigan Press is bringing, bringing out my dad's dissertation. And, uh, and, uh, and, and this feature of it, that 
that the ideas and the history are used to glorify an identity is a central feature. Um, that's a central feature of colonial education in East Africa. Um, so, and, and this kind of uh, forcing of identification of the people with this perspective. Uh, of course, there was a great amount of resistance, but also the people who underwent that uh, education. I was once talking to Makoma about it. I said, you know, the people he's studying became all the politicians in Kenya. And he said, no, Jason, the people he's studying are the ones who robbed Kenya blind. Um, the Kenyatta family is the wealthiest family, certainly the wealthiest family in Kenya. They might be the largest landholders in East Africa. They own o over 500,000 acres. So, uh, so, so this kind of erasing of your history, getting everyone to identify with the perspective of the dominant group is what interests me. This kind of use of ideas, not to teach you the ideas, but to get you to occupy a perspective of domination is what I'm trying to bring out in my book and the distinctive in my work. And, and I think it's what we need to focus on when we think about the present attacks on education in the current moment. Um, and, uh, and it's not just, and as should be clear, so that's colonialism. <laughs> um, other versions of totalitarianism work, use the suppression of ideas uh, to keep themselves in power, to, to, uh, to resist threats to, uh, to the system. Uh, so, so there there is no possibility of the Kikuyu religion coming back in Kenya. Now, the the domination of Christianity is complete. <laughs> uh, of course, there are Muslims uh, as well, but the the traditional religions have been kind of they're not taught. They're not elements. Uh, uh, Wangechi Mutu talks about how. Because Catholic schools are. I mean, I don't want to go to. I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but this is what I'm working on right now. Wangechi Mutu talks about um, how, you know, she gravitated, uh, my my wife went to the same elementary school she went to, Loreto Convent Musangari, and it's a Catholic school. And Mutu talks about how she gravitates towards Catholic schools. Some Kenyan Catholicism has this grip because Catholicism allows allowed for people to do their tribal dances and it incorporated elements. Catholicism has a long tradition of incorporating local culture into masses, say, which the harsh version of Anglicanism uh, and the Church of Scotland in, in Kenya did not. Um, but so that's colonialism. Um, let's look at Stalinism, uh, which also relied heavily and deeply on uh, on. Uh, suppression of ideas. So the Soviet Union kept secret from its education system the massacre of, of 22,000 Polish officers and political leaders at Kaiten, Kaiten, blaming it instead on the Nazis. And for generations, the Soviet Union masked the violence of the gulag from its citizens. And the best, wor the best work on the mass violence of Stalin's gulags during the 30s and 40s has been published in the last few years. Um, in her 2017 book, Illness and Inhumanity in Stalin's Gulag, Galfo Alexopoulos made the case that the overall death count of the Gulag in these years was millions more than it is officially thought because they released people right before their deaths. So they wouldn't have to be counted uh, in the Gulag. So, uh, and, and, and the more, and, and once you notice that these conceptualizations and form, form, formulations uh, of uh, of of the uh, of history, um, well, these conceptualizations and formula for, uh, formulations to protect power and identity can happen almost accidentally. Like, so I went back to Germany at, at the age of fifteen. I won a scholarship because I was like, "Hey, I'm German," and, and so I went and I was in German schools and uh, and I went I went to gymnasium in 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 uh, in Dortmund and. They uh, and when we taught the, were taught the Holocaust, we were taught that you know it was all about death camps, and the and the ordinary Germans didn't know about Auschwitz, which was true, and you know um, the guards in Auschwitz were mostly Slavs, you know those those Untermenschen, those 
crazy Slavs. And so if the, and of course there were the Assas, but the Assas weren't real Germans. They were like the Ku Klux Klan. They were like the, the super evil people. So there was the Assas who were like the special evil people. And then there were the Slav guards and the ordinary Germans didn't know about it. So if the Holocaust was Auschwitz, then ordinary Germans didn't know about it and didn't do it. But then this concept, and it was very curious to me because all seven of my great aunts and uncles, my mother's the only survivor and her sister are the only survivors of the family, and all seven of my great aunts and uncles were shot within the first six months of Hitler's invasion of East uh, of Eastern uh, of Eastern Poland, uh, together with all their kids. So everyone was shot. Nobody made it to camps. So it wasn't until 2010 that this concept, Holocaust by bullet, was formulated. The Wehrmacht shot 1.2 million Jews in the first six months of their uh, invasion of Eastern, uh, of uh, after the Maltov Ribbentrop Pact was was <laughs> was breached. Let's say, <laughs> and and those people don't were not killed in 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 death camps, and they were killed by the ordinary Wehrmacht. And here's something to know about Germany. A lot of people were in the Wehrmacht in the in the western in the Eastern Front. It wasn't some. It wasn't like the secret deaths had totem caught. It wasn't just the Waffen SS. It, it, you know, all of my friends, their grandfathers. This is the 1980s. Like the majority of them had been in the Wehrmacht, and the majority of them had been on the Eastern Front. So, if, but Germany somehow had a way of avoiding that. You know. And it was a way of avoiding having to conceptualize the ordinariness of the experience of mass killing. Um, and similarly, I was raised, my mother was born in Siberia and raised in the Gulag till she was five and has incredibly harsh stories about it. But because she wasn't a Holocaust survivor, because when she went back to Poland, nobody was left, she never taught, it wasn't like, she was like, no, I'm not a survivor, that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, there was nothing to eat, but, you know, they weren't shooting us. So, so even though my mother clearly was a survivor of something <laughs> because she was that way, uh, she never, I was never allowed to talk about her that way because the gulag wasn't a concept for her. The gulag wasn't a thing um, because, because it was a source of shame for her group of Polish Jews that they survived at all. Um, so, so having reading the gulag literature has helped me understand my own family, but it was kind of, you know, if you're Eastern European, it was forbidden to you, uh, the gulag literature, you couldn't really read about the, the, so these structures of omission are what are, uh, these structures of omission are central to attend to in thinking about education. So, uh, so, okay. So how do you, so it's a, so I, what I've done so far is I've talked about two concepts and, you know, if we just talk about these two concepts, that's enough. Uh, sorry, I have kids, so I'm ill until for the next like five years. Um, so, um, so, so the, the two concepts we've talked about is the teaching of history and universal ideas, not as a way to teach history and universal ideas, but a way to glorify a certain identity. So it's like, hey, in Germany, you read the Nazis allowed you to read Kant. But the reason they allowed you to read Kant is not because Kant is talking about the universality of ideas, because you're supposed to think he's German and he's great because he's German. And you well, well, the, the work is great. He's German. It shows how great Germany is. Um, so, uh, so, so, and, and the second thing I've been talking about is the omission, the suppression of ideas, which we can even do to ourselves in the case of my mother. Like I grew up just being entirely told by my mother that her childhood was wonderful. And, you know, it was just nothing better than to be in Siberia in 1943. Um, but because, but she had been, so I had not had that concept of the gulag. So, uh, so, and this can happen 
And then this can happen as in the case of the concept of the Holocaust of bullets. Like, I don't think there was like an intentional desire of Germans in the 1980s to, I mean, it was too, it would be too clever, too much to attribute to them that they sort of did this jujitsu, but it was clearly a way of self-protection of protecting themselves from having to, to say, okay, there were some bad guys, the SS, but the rest of us were just victims too. Or pass or mitläufer. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about um, fascist myths now, and probably that's all I'll be able to get to. Is there gonna be a uh, um, uh, should I leave? How much? How long should I leave for questions? Um, well, you're you're still in time, so um, if you let's say you can talk uh, still like twenty minutes if you want, and then okay, there's okay. Still, yeah, great. Okay, so. Uh, so, so what I want to do is I want to talk. I want to talk about. So, well, fascist education sets up fascist politics. Um, fascist politics works a particular way. So the education system has to set you up to be receptive to it. So, what is fascist politics? It's a form of mass politics that mobilizes members of a uh, of a nation's dominant group by appeal to fear and loss. So it's a form of mass politics that gets the members of the dominant group um, to be receptive to messages of fear and loss. Um, that is, before it comes to power, so fascist movements start as democratic, they start in political parties or as political parties, and they seek to win elections. So before it comes to party, this is why the literature on fascism generally separates fascism is social and political movement, one chapter of Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism from fascism and power, which is about fascist regimes. So we're talking about, um, and, and fascist education, what you wanna do, what a fascist social and political movement should do is attack education systems to get them to change, to make their politics more successful. So then they can get into power. And when they're in power, they can change the whole education system to keep themselves in power. So, uh, so in chapter 17 of Black Reconstruction, uh, Back to Slavery, uh, which is uh, my favorite chapter, uh, describing the reaction of Southern whites to newly emancipated Black citizens, Du Bois writes, how is it that men who want certain things done by brute force can so often depend upon the mob. By the way, I mean, I'm sort of geeky about this. These constant overlaps between the literature on Nazism and the literature on Jim Crow. Uh, you know, the mob, central concept in Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism. Um, also central to Du Bois in talking about the violence of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so, how is it that men who want certain things by brute force can so often depend upon the mob? Total depravity, human hate, and schadenfreude do not explain fully the mob spirit in America. Before the wide eyes of the mob is ever the shape of fear. Back of, uh, 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 back of, the, writing, back of the writing yelling cruel-eyed demons who break, destroy, maim, and lynch, and burn at the stake is a knot, large or small, of normal human beings. And these human beings at heart are desperately afraid of something. Of what? Of many things, but usually of using, losing their jobs, their hopes, their savings, their plans for their children, of the actual uh, pangs of hunger, of dirt, of crime. It is a nucleus of ordinary men that continually give the mob its initial and awful impetus. Around this nucleus, to be sure, gather snow snowball-wise all matter of flotsam, filth, and human gar garbage, and every lewdness of alcohol and current fashion. But all this is the horrible covering of this inner nucleus of fear. How, then, is the mob to be met and quelled? If it represents public opinion, even passing passionate public opinion, it cannot permanently be put down by a police which public opinion appoints and pays. Three methods of quelling the mob are at hand. The first, by proving to its human, 
honest nucleus that the fear is false, ill-grounded, unnecessary. Or secondly, if the fear is true or apparently or partially true, attacking the fearful thing openly, either by organized police power or by frank civil wars did Mussolini. Or thirdly, by secret underground ways, the method of the Ku Klux Klan. So what Du Bois is, 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 is saying there is that, is that you can actually get under, you can actually, uh, you can actually undermine the fear by education. You can actually like show people that their fear is ungrounded. Um, and if the fear is let, let, is not undermined by good education, then, uh, then what will result is either the state imposing state violence on the fear, usually of minorities, racial, religious, sexual minorities, or mass vigil vigilante violence. So in fascist politics, fear and loss are generated in the dominant group by the strategic use of national myths. One myth locates the identity of the nation in the identity of the dominant national group. So the way it works, say, in the United States is you say, look, um, uh, uh, right, one myth locates the identity of the nation in the identity of the dominant national group. Another locates the nation's greatness and the great achievements of prominent members of the dominant national group. The latter myth is used in the ju justification of the former. So the greatness of America is because of our founding fathers. Our founding fathers were white Christian men. The greatness of the nation is because of white Christian men. That's how it works. It's all very clear with you know, with the different forms of of domination I've been talking about, Nazism, German fascism, British colonialism. Uh, why the hell are you asking a bunch of Kikuyu, a bunch of Kenyans to memorize hundreds and hundreds of years of British imperial history? <laughs> when you're not teaching them about what happened in their own country in 1920, because it's almost like there wasn't a country in 1920. Uh, so in fascist politics, so, so once you set up these, these myths, you can create fear and loss quite easily. In fascist politics, the loss comes from the feeling that the dominant group once had respect to which they're, not, they're now not given. And the fear comes from uh, the, the potential that people outside the dominant group will become centered in some way. So this is the role of great replacement theory, the central role of great replacement theory in fascist politics. And you find the logic of replacement everywhere in fascist politics. For instance, uh, why are, uh, you know, uh, Nazis, just to take an example, Nazis focused on gender fluidity. Nazis argued very strongly for traditional gender roles. Why were the Nazis so committed to gen traditional gender roles? Um, well, because, well, it, it, it was a tactic for them. There was many reasons. There's several reasons, of course, because of patriarchy and in, involves uh, traditional gender roles, requires them. Um, but also because they could generate a feeling of fear and loss. Like, you know, you, you're gonna lose these roles if people say they're variable, uh, they're fluid. Um, women might be replaced. Um, so uh, so my, my uh, and of course, great replacement theory, racial great replacement theory is something we live, we, we have to live slightly less with now that Tucker Carlson has been fired, but it's all, it's, it's massively normalized. Um, so my parents faced fascist movements that targeted their identity as Jews as existential threats uh, to the to, to national projects. And I think this is still going on. I'm spending more and more time in Eastern Europe, and I'm just going to mouth off about it right now. I mean, Eastern European anti-Semitism takes the form of sort of uh, saying Jews are stealing the victimhood narrative of 
of groups. So if you're in Poland, people are like, well, you know, the Poles suffered terribly under Nazism. And you guys are here saying that, you know, you're the real victims of Nazis. Actually, uh, there's, there's, um, there's, you're replacing, you know, it's, it's kind of weird because different national groups in Eastern Europe will often think of their victimhood as their central identity and Jews threaten that. <laughs> uh, okay, let me, okay. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so according to Hitler, so uh, Jews, uh, well, not just according to Hitler, the role my people play is we're supposed to be doing replacements of white people all around the world. That's like, yeah. uh, they the uh, w were, when in Charlottesville, they chanted, the Jews will not replace us. They didn't mean that we were going to physically replace Christians. That would be impossible. It meant that we were engineering that, the replacement of white Christians by non-whites in order to uh, do, in order to take over once we destroyed white Christianity. That's the logic. So Hitler got this idea of great replacement from the United States. I'm a proud American. And uh, and this was one of our, so one of our, one of our, uh, that was a, I am a proud American, but that is a, uh, the, uh, uh, that was sarcastic. Uh, so in 1916, the American eugenicist Madison Grant, a Yale grad, published The Passing of the Great Race, which decried the supposing, supposed replacement of whites in America by black people and immigrants, including his favorite example, Polish Jews. According to, to Grant, these groups posed an existential threat to the Nordic race, America's native class. So, uh, so this is almost parroted word for word by Trump once when he was talking about shithole countries. And he was, he was like, why don't we get good immigrants, you know, the Nordics. I think he used the term Nordics. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so, so, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap up and, and not, uh, and not, uh, I'm going to wrap up with the following point, though obviously there's a lot more to say. Um, the kind of education system that prepares people for great replacement theory, um, places the members of the dominant group at the center of a narrative of greatness. And it suggests that replacing that dominant group or decentering them is a threat to the nation itself. Uh, so, so this uh, so this structure it, 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 so it's not it's not just, so it's not nationalism that we need to look for. It's not it's not just nationalism because this kind of education I'm talking about is not simply a nationalist education. It's a nationalism of the dominant group. And you can see that it's not a nationalist education by its targets. For example, the fascist movement in the United States that we now face targets Nicole Hannah-Jones's 1619 project. But Nicole Hannah-Jones's 1619 project is American nationalism. It's American exceptionalist nationalism. Unlike Du Bois, Nicole Hannah, so Nicole Hannah Jones begins, begins the 1619 Project lead essay by talking about how her father, her black father, always raised the American flag every day in front of their house. And she talks about how patriotic black Americans are because they fought in every war. But there's no criticism in Nicole Hannah Jones of America's wars. Uh, in fact, the opposite. She's saying, you know, she's saying American greatness is because, is largely because of Black Americans. Black Americans fought in our wars. Black Americans advanced our democracy. I don't disagree with much of what she says, but it's clearly a nationalist project. <laughs> it's clearly a project that presupposes America's exceptional greatness. She's not even criticizing America's wars. Du Bois who urged black families to send their children to, to World War I in the 1920s, deeply regretted that, as Chad Williams's book really brings out. He deeply regretted that as he saw it as a mistake. But there's no hint of that in, in Nicole Hannah-Jones. Nicole Hannah-Jones is saying America is great and black people have a large amount of agency in its greatness. I don't disagree with much of this message, but it's clearly an American nationalist project. 
And yet she's been attacked for denigrating the United States. There you see that the fascist social and political movement we face is not an American nationalist project. It's a white nationalist project. And with that, I will end. Thank you.